So uh, I want to take you way back. Uh, we're, we're, I mentioned about 25 years I've been in research, and that was basically in turf. And I learned some really good lessons back then. And, and there was a guy named Tim Berthesel at the Anderson that started, gosh, 50, 40, 50 years ago, something like that. But I really started to understand the value of third-party research. So that unbiased research where someone else is doing the research, universities, perfect third-party research. About 2008, we got a grant from Ohio Department of Development, um, and uh, we had a researcher, this is before Jessica came on, um, that was uh, looking or doing all our third-party research in ag. And I said, hey, we need to find a, a research partner or a place that we can do agronomic research and get the environmental fate at the same time. So go find a place that'll do that. And she kept coming back with it doesn't exist. And so I thought that that's, you're wrong. You're new in career, that can't be right. So we, I started doing work and after like a year, we basically gave up. The only place we could find was a place, a private research center that are four by six foot plots of 24 square foot. Can you get imagine planting corn on that and trying to get a good picture of agronomics plus environmental fate. And not only that, they didn't do surface water, they only did subsurface. So it was really not a place that was gonna work for us. So I, I had been talking to Chris for a lot of years. What we need in Northwest Ohio is a place to do unbiased research, real world crop production plus environmental fate. And uh, here, I was like, just Anderson's go build it. And I'm like, well, the challenge with that is you need it to be a, a, something that is owned by the community. Something that is where researchers can come in. It's an asset for the community where researchers can come in and do unbiased research. So um, fast forward to the H2 Ohio um, project, uh, technical project, and also right at the same time, uh, US EPA was holding a national program around nitrogen and phosphorus. So the Andersons entered both of those contests and went to the next stage on both of those contests. We eventually got a call from David Emmerman, Ohio EPA saying, US EPA wants to fund uh, some work uh, with Struvite. So that was our Struvite DG, we call it commercially Smart Phos DG. Um, that the, the challenge was when we got with Vinayak, so I originally went to Kevin King. Kevin King is sort of the, the, the king of phosphorus research in, in Ohio. Uh, and he gave me this, the third time, he gave me the same, same answer. I can't do that work. And uh, so he gave me Vinayak's name. I contacted Vinayak and uh, the same challenge came is where are we gonna test? We could do the agronomic research. We ended up having, we actually started the project that I'm talking about, Struvite has been already funded $850,000. That work started last fall um, in Gibsonburg. They're doing the agronomic research out there. This is agronomic and environmental fate here. Um, so Vinayak wanted them separate, which is, which is great. Um, but as part of that, again, we had the same situation. Where are we gonna test that? He told me about this place. It had been, and you know the history better than I do. It, it, for 20 years, it did research around drainage. Uh, but now has been, it didn't have a purpose, so he wanted to swoop in and, and get the work done here. But with that, the infrastructure needed upgrades. So as part of the grant that we got for, through US EPA and Ohio EPA, the $850,000 grant, about a quarter million of that grant was for infrastructure upgrades. So that has already started, and Kyle will tell you about that. Uh, as part of that, only about, what, 60% of this property is going to be upgraded as part of that project. So there's infrastructure, quarter million, and then the rest of that funding will be for the project. So that's variable expenses that'll last four years. But then what do you do with this property? So I asked Vinayak, hey, what would it take to get the other parts of this facility all set up with monitoring stations? And he went back to work and he came up with a number of $120,000. So it seemed like, like, oh my God, we're so close to having like the center of research for protecting Lake Erie right here in North, Northwest Ohio. So I went to work with uh, first starting where home is and that is the Andersons and, and uh, they put up uh, half of that. So they have a halfing, half of the match grant, $60,000, $20,000 a year for three years. 
So now it's going out and finding some other partners that might be interested in, in developing this. He believes this asset infrastructure will last 20 to 30 years. And I think that's what a great gift to, uh, to Northwest Ohio in doing that. And with that, I'll toss it over to Kyle and he can tell you a little bit more about what they're doing today and what the future plans are. Uh, so I'll give you a brief overview of kind of what I'm thinking the agenda will kind of go look like. Uh, I'll give you a little overview of DARA as the association, uh, what that is, um, sort of what has been done in the past, uh, what it was originally made out to be, uh, and then some of the changes that we're looking to make here. Um, if we want to take a quick stroll through the uh, outbuilding here, um, I've got a whole bunch of different visual maps uh, to help me explain it a little bit easier here. So if, if you guys want to come through here, Defiance County, uh, the Defiance Agricultural Research Association. Uh, it was started back around the 1990s um, with the previous ag educator and ag sort of club uh, in the area. Uh, we have a board of three industry professionals, three farmers, uh, and then one at large that is our kind of governing group that makes the decisions and, and gives me the okay to do research out here uh, and change things and, and go through all that, that process. Um, my role uh, is secretary treasurer. Um, just administrative, um, purely uh, volunteer based um, from everybody in that, that organization. Um, so if we look at sort of the DARA site here, uh, this is the original DARA site. Uh, these drainage plots, um, a little bit that was behind this wooded area here, uh, and then over behind the Humane Society. Um, this is all county commissioner owned land, um, so they're wonderfully supportive uh, in our endeavors to bring these agricultural and environmental resources to the community uh, in the broader region. Um, but if you look at that first map here, uh, in 1990, uh, the original plan was for drainage, intensi drainage intensity um, research to be done. Um, so we have our four plots here that were drainage intensity uh, with an undrained uh, control, um, as well as a wetlands and subsurface irrigation plots um, behind the wooded lands here. Um, essentially, all that surface or that subsurface drainage from the drainage intensity um, studies was going into a wetland created over there uh, that would then be pumped over into our reservoir lake here to then be used for our sub irrigation um, studies. Um, but so, control drainage structures uh, where you see that ISCO sampler uh, sitting on top of that column there. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say a tile, when you say controlled drainage, what, what does that mean? Uh, control drainage from a subsurface tile standpoint. Um, so control drainage uh, is essentially like an underwater dam that slows down the, the subsurface drainage. Um, so instead of those tile running full and as much water as it can handle going out, um, that control drainage structure allows you to set boards to slow down that that water, um, essentially raising the water table um, up, um, allowing for more water retention uh, overall in your in your soils. So yeah, here we have four four acre plots. Um, each of them has a controlled strain structure on the bottom two thirds of it. Um, essentially, that was just uh, where they decided to put the control drainage structure to have. Uh, some control drainage replications um, as well as control or non control drainage um, sort of replications on those sites. So, as we transition into what we're kind of looking to uh, do infrastructurally to sort of build up the site uh, for the future, uh, we can sort of flip to the map that'll look like this. This will give you a, a, our kind of overview of what we're looking to do. Um, with our drainage modifications. Um, so some of the modifications that we're looking at doing here, um, we're going to retile um, all of the plots. Um, they were originally done in 1990, um, so they've sort of gotten to the end of their lifespan. Um, so while we're able to sort of rejuvenate the plots here, uh, we want to set it up for that 25, 30 years down the road. Um, what we'll be doing is we'll be doing so full plot drainage, uh, but then we will be isolating each four acre plot into three sections. 
Um, that'll give us a lot more replication and at each section we'll be able to take subsurface and surface waters from both sides of that that section. So each plot is going to be an acre and a third basically? Uh, roughly, uh, but those will be broken down the center uh, so each four acre plot will have six replications within it and each of those will be isolated for subsurface and surface water. Uh, at each uh, relatively close to where the sort of uh, control drain structure and ISPA sampler are now. Uh, we're going to have uh, collection sampling spots um, sort of as a manhole into the ground uh, where we can sort of collect all the subsurface and surface water uh, individually uh, at one central location. Um, so that's what those three dots in between each of the plots are representing. Charles, would you like to sure. show them how a disco sampler works? Yeah, if, if, do we want to walk over and yes. do this setup here? Yeah. So the way we capture the concentration component is with uh, a automated samplers, and they collect samples at certain intervals. Um, and once you look at that over a period of time and match that up with the volume data from the same time, then you get a picture of how much is leaving over uh, the course of you know, the study. And so a, a typical sampler setup are these ISCO samplers and they, um, they can be programmed to take samples at regular time intervals. So there's a bunch of bottles in here and um, the, uh, the sampler is programmed to take one aliquot, which is a portion of a bottle, every uh, six hours. And so one bottle, we fill it up with four, and you know, this is all is variable, people do it different ways, but uh, this whole bottle would represent a day's worth of water leaving the field. And so... So the screw bike project is the first project that we're doing, um, but with the setup and the infrastructure that we're building into the site, uh, it's really opening up a lot of opportunities for like future projects where we, uh, could put uh, manure on and do half incorporated, half unincorporated, uh, and sort of look at some of those things and how those are affecting it.